Backdrop, Second Wind's video essay series looking at film and television. It resembles, but is legally distinct from a video series that I used to host on that other YouTube channel. I'm your host, Darren Mooney. I'll be joined by a team of some of the best video editors in the business. Omar Ahmed, Jesse Schwab, Matt Laughlin, and more besides. I'm very conscious that this might be the first time you've watched one of these essays narrated by me. If so, we're delighted to have you. This is not a conventional review show. We are looking at bringing back reviews of film and television if there's interest in that, but the idea of the backdrop is to get a bit beyond discussions of thing good or thing bad. There are enough shouty people on the internet with strong opinions about how a given piece of pop culture is either the best or worst thing ever, and I've never had the lung capacity for that. So the show's more thing interesting or thing worth talking about. In our previous collaborations, we've covered everything from the way in which streaming was never financially viable, to the systemic issues affecting the writing of your favorite franchise shows, to the visual language of promising young woman. We'll talk about film, television, the business and show business, and larger cultural trends. Hell, we might even talk about why every indie dramedy ends with a scene of the main character dancing. It has been a pleasure to work with this team in any capacity over the past couple of years, and I believe I speak for all of us here when I say it's good to be back. So with that in mind, let's jump right on in. Monarch Legacy of Monsters is a show about symmetry. It's about doubling and mirroring, concepts separating across time and space intersecting on one central point. This is reflected in any number of ways across the show, right down to the logo of the eponymous monster hunting agency. It's an M, you know, for Monarch, doubled across the horizontal plane to create an image of two triangles that cross over at the center. It's a simple but effective image, and it speaks to the central preoccupations of Legacy of Monsters, the new Apple TV Plus streaming series that serves as a spin-off to Warner Brothers Monsterverse. Throughout the show, images and ideas are doubled. The metaphor is made very apparent in the show's opening credits, in which images are doubled through a fold in the center of the screen. Sometimes those objects are mirrored across time, modern technology contrasted with more analog equivalents. Sometimes the imagery seems separated by culture, American newspaper headlines are contrasted with coverage of the same events in Japan. This symmetry is woven into the show's narrative fabric. Structurally, Legacy of Monsters unfolds across two timelines, each built around a triptych of characters. In the wake of the Second World War, Keiko Mira and Bill Randa work with Lee Shaw to establish Monarch. Then, in the wake of the events of Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, Kate, Kentaro, and May become embroiled in their own modern mystery. If these two unfolding plots have a point of overlap that ties past and future together, it is Lee Shaw himself. And look, I'm thrilled that Apple TV Plus were able to rustle up some real star power. By the end of the two-episode premiere, Kate Kintaro and May have made contact with an older Lee Shaw, who's looking fairly spry for a man who must be over a century old. What can I say? Good genes, huh? Shaw has been a part of Monarch since the beginning, and provides a continuity between what was and what is. However, the characters in Legacy of Monsters are not only split between past and future, they're also separated by the Pacific Ocean. Kate is introduced traveling from San Francisco to Tokyo following the death of her father, Hiroshi Randa. On settling his affairs, Kate discovered that Hiroshi owned an apartment in Japan. Dispatched by her mother to investigate, she's shocked to discover that her father had an entire other family. This is how she meets her half-brother, Kentaro. If Shaw serves as the axis on which the show forms a temporal symmetry, then Hiroshi serves a similar function for both Kate and Kentaro. These are two strangers separated by thousands of miles, but who share one crucial thing in common. It's a clever hook for a weekly television show, establishing immediate and effective emotional stakes. It takes the scale and spectacle of the G-Day monster attacking Godzilla and offers a human equivalent. Indeed, Legacy of Monsters suggests that Hiroshi is perhaps comparable to Godzilla, intertwined with him. The show takes place in the aftermath of a horrific and devastating tragedy that has left San Francisco in ruins, but the revelations about Hiroshi have had a similar impact on his own children. Everything that Kate and Kentaro thought they knew about their father and about themselves has been revealed to be a lie, and they are scrambling through the emotional aftermath of that realization. Also, you know, literal fallout. I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. There is something quite interesting in building a Godzilla-centric series around the idea of one family divided across two continents. Like Hiroshi, Godzilla's a concept so large that it stands astride the Pacific Ocean like a colossus. Like Shaw, Godzilla has a murky and occasionally convoluted history that stretches back decades. As Kate and Gitaro dig into their own family history, Lexi of Monsters feels like an effort to reconcile two very different cultural understandings of Godzilla. The monster is a Japanese creation, first appearing, as one might suspect, in Godzilla in 1954. That film was quickly re-edited for American audiences, with an alternate cut that was released two years later under the title Godzilla King of the Monsters. 
This version cut 20 minutes from the film to make the project palatable both linguistically and politically for the American market. Dynamic violence, Sammy Jackson, spectacular thrills, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. It worked. The film was a massive success, and many subsequent Keiju films would be similarly reworked for American audiences. Quick sidebar here, because it's worth emphasizing just what a massive and influential success Godzilla King of the Monsters was. This American alternate cut of the classic Godzilla movie was co-directed by Terry O. Morse. Morse was a film editor and film doctor who basically took sequences from the original film and edited in actor Raymond Burr as character Steve Martin. Not that Steve Martin. Extended portions of Godzilla King of the Monsters find Martin edited into sequences from the original film, offering commentary in English for American viewers. Afraid my Japanese is a little rusty. Let's face it, Steve Martin reacts to random Godzilla clips is the pandemic podcast we deserve but never got. The American re-edit of the movie is very consciously indebted to classic American monster movies. For example, it's explained that the indigenous population sacrifice young women to Godzilla in the same way that indigenous tribes sacrifice women to King Kong. Centuries ago, they used to send a young girl out on a raft each year as a sacrifice. The structure of the movie owes a lot to invasion of the body snatchers beginning in the aftermath of horrific events and then flashing back to explain how they came to be. Indeed, it's possible to situate Godzilla King of the Monsters in the larger context of American monster movies like Them, or even The Day the Earth Stood Still. Of course, in retailoring the movie for American audiences, a lot of the specific context of the Japanese movie has been lost. For example, barring an exposition scene in the middle of the movie, a lot of the overt and direct references to nuclear weapons have been stripped out of Godzilla King of the Monsters. The subtext is still there, the inference is still made, but it is not directly invoked. Whereas the Japanese movie is concerned that the oxygen bomb could lead to a future arms race that could destroy mankind, the American version is more concerned that the oxygen bomb might fall into the wrong hands. However, Godzilla King of the Monsters was a massive commercial success. It earned $2 million in theatrical release, which is 10 times what Rashomon had made several years earlier, despite being an Oscar and Golden Lion winner. You could argue that the success of Godzilla King of the Monsters and other Japanese monster movies at the American box office had a profound impact on how American movies would be made going forward. For example, the 1976 remake of King Kong would eschew the stop-motion special effects that defined the original movie in favor of a man in a costume recalling the working Godzilla. That movie went on to win an Oscar for special effects. Is terrifying when aroused, but has the soul of a romantic lover. Dino De Laurentiis. <laughs> Godzilla had a sizable cultural footprint in America, but it was largely defined by a re-editing of the original film. Also, fun fact, most of the Japanese characters in Godzilla King of the Monsters were dubbed by James Hong. This must be the only time the oxygen destroyer will be used. End sidebar. Toho Studios sought to capitalize on the success of Godzilla in America with a trans-Pacific crossover. King Kong vs. Godzilla was the third film in the Godzilla franchise following Godzilla Raids Again. It pit Godzilla against a uniquely American movie monster. Again? This movie had a distinct American cut. Godzilla has disappeared without a trace. While the differences between the two versions are often exaggerated, the ending was changed. In the Japanese cut, both monsters roar at the end. In the American cut, only King Kong can be heard. However, Hollywood would take decades to completely assimilate Godzilla. Producer Henry G. Saperstein claimed to have spent a decade trying to convince Toho to let an American studio take their shot at the monster. In October 1992, it was announced that TriStar Pictures had secured the rights to an American Godzilla movie. Crucially, one of the terms of that agreement was that Toho would be allowed to develop their own films in parallel with any American production, effectively branching the franchise. Toho were very insistent about how the monster should be portrayed. According to producer Robert Freed, it was a painstaking process. They even sent me a four-page single-space memo, describing the physical requirements the Godzilla in our film have to have. They are very protective. I'm sick of Godzilla! There's little indication that director Roland Emmerich was particularly concerned with respecting that memo. A movie I never wanted to make. <laughs> Emmerich's Godzilla opened to terrible reviews and disappointing box office. 
Of course, Emmerich was no stranger to bad reviews, and he handled it with all the dignity, grace, and subtlety that one might expect from the director of Independence Day. Welcome to Earth. Pointedly, Emmerich's Godzilla features the villainous character of Mayor Ebert and his lackey Gene, who bear absolutely no resemblance to prominent American film critics Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. Yeah, the only good thing about uh, Mayor Ebert and his sidekick was that at least Godzilla didn't step on it. Many of the people involved with the Japanese franchise were unimpressed by Emmerich's blockbuster. There was a concern that the adaptation did not understand what the monster meant. It's not Godzilla, argued actor Kenpachiro Satsuma. It doesn't have his spirit. Producer Shogo Tamiyama opined that Hollywood's Godzilla is just a normal monster. He's not God. Hollywood treated Godzilla as a live monster or live animal. They shot him down with missiles and all that. While the underwhelming box office results killed any chance of a sequel, Emmerich's Godzilla spun off into an animated series. Just over a decade later, Warner Brothers would take another shot at adaptation with Gareth Edwards' Godzilla, which was intended as a launching pad to an entire MonsterVerse. It spawned sequels and spin-offs, including feature films Kong Skull Island, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Godzilla vs. Kong, not to mention the television show Monarch. Throughout these projects, there's a recurring sense that American studios don't entirely understand what Godzilla represents in Japanese culture. Edwards' Godzilla comes closest, presenting the monster as something approaching a metaphysical apocalypse. On the other hand, King of the Monsters suggests these creatures are perhaps a metaphor for climate change, maybe? They are part of the Earth's natural defense system, a way to protect the planet, to maintain its balance. Why not? For its part, Monarch leans surprisingly heavily into a retro war and terror metaphor in a way that recalls something like Amazon's Rings of Power. It's all about giving us the illusion of safety, like spraying us for parasites would help prevent another monster attack. What if the next one doesn't pop up in the middle of the Pacific? What if it's near New York or Washington? These various disjointed approaches to Godzilla lack the metaphorical clarity of contemporary Japanese takes on the monster, such as Hidekiyo Now or Shinji Haguchi's Shin Godzilla. However, whatever differences exist between them, both America and Japan have their own branch Godzilla franchises. Toho's most recent Godzilla film, Godzilla Minus One, will release in the United States on the same day that Apple TV Plus streams the fourth episode of Monarch. To be fair, these two Godzilla franchises have been entwined for years. The American version of the monster, known affectionately or unaffectionately as Zilla, appeared in the massive Toho crossover Final Wars in 2004. Since this was the 50th anniversary film, I thought, why not include the American Godzilla, explained Tomiyama. That said, the inclusion wasn't entirely to celebrate Zilla. There is some special meaning to having him in this film, but mostly, we just wanted to show which Godzilla is stronger. Flex Toho, flex. In contrast, Monarch feels much more earnest in its efforts to reconcile these two very different visions of the iconic monster. This is reflected in Kate and Kentaro, two half-siblings on either side of the Pacific Ocean, to confront the realization that her father had a whole secret life in Japan. It also informs Keiko Mira's story, a Japanese scientist working for the American military in the wake of the Second World War. As Lee points out, she exists caught between two worlds. Not a woman. Certainly not a Japanese woman. Well, you want me to lie and pretend that's not the way things are? Monarch suggests that these very different perspectives can be cumulative rather than exclusive, that a viewer doesn't need to choose between one or the other. One of the show's recurring motifs is the overlaying of data, two seemingly disconnected data points overlapping to reveal a complete picture. In the show's second episode, Keiko and Bill track a monster by combining his makeshift map of the island's folklore with her printout of local radiation trails. Together, they form a complete picture. It's an interesting hook for Monarch, which is a show primarily about fleshing out the mythology of this larger universe. The show doesn't quite have the budget to offer titan-sized thrills on a weekly basis, and so it concerns itself with the fabric of this world. At its best, it suggests that not only is Godzilla too big to be completely captured on screen, but that the monster is large enough to stand astride the Pacific. Now, back at the start I said the backdrop was not a thing good or thing bad show, but I don't want to pause to note a very good thing. The past few weeks have been phenomenal, and I want to stop here to thank and acknowledge everyone that has made that possible, especially you, the viewer. I'm Irish. Our two biggest exports are actors with unpronounceable first names and stoicism, so I'm not very good at this, but thank you. The outpouring of support and encouragement from this community has been genuinely heartening. 
I am honestly thrilled to be here doing the thing that I love doing with some of the most talented people in this field, and that is only possible thanks to your support. So to all those who have donated through Patreon, through Ko-fi, by buying merch, by spreading the word, by subscribing, by upvoting. By the way, it's, it, is it coffee or Ko-fi? Anyway, thank you. And if you can give, and I know that's a big ask, particularly now, it allows us to remain independent and to cover the stuff that we want to cover in the way that we want to cover it. There'll be links in the notes below, and every little does help. But yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed, and we have some fun stuff lined up for you. I've been Darren Mooney, and this was The Backdrop.